Hi, my name is Chris Matulitz and I am the curator of community and academic programs here at the Biggs Museum. And we have our special guest tour guide, Brian Grover. Hi, Brian. Hi. <laughs> um, so today what we're gonna do is we're gonna change up our format just a little bit from our previous tours. Uh, if you've joined us before, normally we jump right into the artwork, um, but because this is such a large exhibition um, and such an impressive and prolific artist, I wanted to do something similar to what we did when we had Salvador Dali here, where we had a little bit more of a, a chat with you um, and between ourselves, although I was off camera for that one, um, before we got started. So with that, uh, we'll be starting this tour with a little bit of setting the stage to this exhibition and what they can, what they, what you can see here at the Bigs. So, Ryan, mm. <laughs> who's Winslow Homer? <laughs> um, so Winslow Homer is uh, probably one of the most famous artists in America of the 1800s. Um, so he was really prolific in the last half of the 1800s. And um, he started his career really as an illustrator, as a printmaker for popular press, newspapers, magazines. And um, eventually that evolved into painted works, quite a few painted works. He's probably best known for his oils, um, but he also did a huge number of watercolors, which are really breathtaking. Um, and uh, I think often individuals sort of ascribe him as the um, sort of illustrator of the 19th century, of the Victorian era here in America. Um, I, I, I feel like, personally, I feel like he's a little bit more uh, a painter of fantasies and a little more aspirational than a realist per se, but he is um, uh, virtuosic in his abilities. He's just a really, really incredible painter. So setting the stage of sort of our, our timeline, um, I know towards the end of his career, Winslow Homer left sort of painting figural scenes at all and transitioned into landscape only. Um, do you know, in comparison, where this is in his career timeline? Rather early in the timeline. So you're looking at sort of his, uh, the print work that he does is really about the birth of him as a visual artist. He's really sort of playing with ideas and sort of working things out. Um, these images that he's creating at this time also filter into a lot of his paintings. Um, and you can see there are um, opportunities to see the evolution between a couple of paintings and uh, and prints here. Um, we don't actually have paintings on display with this exhibition, but we have sort of uh, representations of them. Um, but most importantly, you have the prints that sort of created those images that were then eventually celebrated in paintings. Awesome. And is that what drew you to this exhibition? No, I just like prints. <laughs> I'm, I'm personally really drawn to and intellectually really drawn to reproducible images. Um, I um, love the idea of sharing of, uh, images that people really celebrated on a day to day basis in their lifetimes. I feel like prints can be really approachable for people. Sometimes I think that um, we get so wrapped up as, a, as, as museum goers, we get so wrapped up in, um, in the painting, in the paint, in the, in the materiality of paint and the the, the, the way that it's laid down on a canvas, the technique of actually painting something that we don't really study the image or the story of a narrative. And, um, and Winslow Homer is a pretty good storyteller. And so this was a really great chance to emphasize what he did um, in terms of storytelling. And then also to really just sort of focus on his draftsmanship. Like he is a great painter, largely because he can draw really, really well. And this show represents that. Thanks. Yeah, that's great. Now, can you tell us a little bit about what we're going to see in the show? Like, what types of works are we looking at? Almost every print he ever produced. <laughs> this is a huge exhibition. You can probably see it behind me a little bit, but the, the prints are literally just sort of scaling the walls. Um, uh, 
I knew about this exhibition because the person who drafted this exhibition, I created this publication. And I'd seen the publication and was really, really drawn to the study of about 250 prints that Winslow Homer had created during his career. And again, this is the first part of his um, first real half of his career, but, um, and it overlaps with the paintings, but really represents him sort of emerging as the image maker. And you see him getting better through time um, as, uh, as an image maker through this show. We have on view here just over 200 of those 250 prints that he produced in his lifetime. So um, I was really drawn to this show because I pretty much knew that you would never get the opportunity to see this many Winslow Homer images ever again. And um, I didn't really realize that how tightly it would fit within our little galleries here at the Biggs Museum um, when I was uh, first taking it on, um, or that I would actually have to share all 200 of the prints as they arrived. But that said, now that it's up, it's pretty amazing. So um, when you do come to see it, spend a little time, get used to it, like come in, come twice, because there's a lot to study. So a couple things to add to that. As we are going through the museum and through the gallery today, we won't be able to stop at every single picture. And you wouldn't want us to. Yeah, it'd be a long time. <laughs> it'd be a long time. Um, I was in here just reading the titles alone of the paintings and lithographs today. Um, and it took me a solid like 45 minutes just to do titles. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of works. Uh, but as we go through, uh, just so you know, we may not be able to hit every style. The majority of what we're looking at today is going to be some form of a lithograph print, am I correct? Um, uh, steel and wood engraving. So different types of engravings. Um, but they range wildly in size and techniques used. Uh, we have everything in here from silhouette works to tiny engravings about that big into very large printed ones. And of course the light box behind me as well, just adding color <laughs> to the print over there. A little drama. Um, so there is a ton of stuff to see and there's a ton of different themes, different topics, uh, different people being represented in this collection. Um, so as you said, Ryan, uh, he was one of the big influencers of artists of the 19th century. Right. Um, that is a tremendous uh, period, particularly in American history, mm -hmm. from where that century started to where it ended, and then even going into the early 20th century, what it becomes. Uh, what are we going to be looking at, and what times are related to the what we're going to see in this exhibition. So um, one of the things that sort of stands out about Winslow Homer is that um, unlike his predecessors and a lot of the people around him, um, you have to think that he came out at the sort of tail end of the Hudson School landscape painters. So they had already ascended and become <clears throat> pretty sensationally known in the Eastern United States um, for developing a, a native born notion of American landscape. And there have been very successful portrait painters in America since colonial periods. But in the years leading up to the Civil War, so those 10 years before the Civil War, um, Homer comes in as a, genre, as, a, as a genre image maker. He was talking about the stories of everyday life. And, um, and again, I want to emphasize that this was sort of an idealized view of life. He was not really settling on how treacherous and how difficult and how um, how hungry people could get, um, uh, how uh, economically depressed a lot of individuals were, um, the experience of immigrants, the experience of enslaved populations, like he was not talking about Native American populations, like he, he was really, really talking about upper, like the emerging middle class, the emer emerging upper middle classes, um, the leisure classes in America, those individuals that were um, apparently sort of benefiting from the Industrial Revolution as it started to unfold in America. And, um, and so his images became kind of symbolic of an American hopes and dream, um, a, a hope and a dream in America of upward mobility. And, um, and at the same time, he is 
creating visions of all of these new phenomena that are coming with industrialization. So he's talking about, um, he's sort of surreptitiously talking about the emancipation of women and the education of children um, and um, about the creation of leisure within the day-to-day -day activities of, of Americans. Um, he was one of the principal illustrators of the Civil War um, and the activities of the Civil War. He, um, uh, it's, 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 with 250 images, it's hard to sort of summarize all the different areas, but you know, he talks about the emergence of professional sports. He talks about a lot of things, <laughs> all the things. He talks about all the things. So um, stuff that's really, really important to everybody in America um, is definitely hit upon this, but at the same time, he really focuses attention on a, really, uh, on a, on a specific group of individuals within our society. Yeah. And as you've pointed out, um, and as we've said before, there are well over uh, 100 works in here. You said over 200 on display? Yes. Um, and you can find all of those and take them home with you with this exhibition catalog that we have it. for sale the here in the store. <laughs> um, I have been told it's cheaper than Amazon um, if you're looking and comparing. Uh, <laughs> but it's just a great representation of the show. Um, and it's just. Um, because you get these really great images of all the things that are in the show, but then you get also this really great description about what's happening in each picture. So it's just a good memorabilia. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and start getting you close to the artwork um, and talking about what you're seeing. Ryan and myself will kind of be tag teaming this. So you'll get two different sort of perspectives and what you're looking at. And we can both answer questions. Um, Ryan, of course, is the curator who brought all of this together for us here um, and has been doing sort of the work and the research with Winslow Homer himself and the time period here in America. Um, and then I myself am a Victorian specialist on societal changes, particularly in the upper middle class and leisure class that are being depicted here. Um, so we will be sort of tag teaming any questions that you have and looking at the different artwork because this period is just so socially complex um, during this time period. And as Brian pointed out, uh, he's really interested in probably one of the most fluctuating social classes where what's in one minute is out the next minute and it's very fashion driven. Um, so that's me saying he's not a Dickensian artist. Um, as Ryan said, he's not painting really the, the lower classes or those who are struggling. He's focused on sort of the happy society. Um, largely. I mean, largely. There, are, there are moments, but. Yeah. Um, so it's just a lot. Uh, so we'll go ahead and start reeling you through the gallery. <laughs> I think I decided I wanted to start at the beach since everybody's at the beach. So um, again, we just have a lot of images to take a look at. So um, we're going to just sort of focus. I think photographically, it's the easy, or cinematography, cinematically, it's the easiest to just sort of focus on some of the images that are in the center of the plane, the wall here. But like I said, everything that you're seeing, we have three and four times more than what you will look at. So um, uh, so let's just get to it. So um, we so this show is divided up into a number of different topics, some of them very serious, like images depicting um, uh, representations of activities associated with the American Civil War, but then also um, really sort of like playful and interesting, or um, not interesting, but playful images about like kids and leisure activities and um, the importance of, um, uh, the importance of play that um, uh, in later 19th century society. So what you see here is called Seesaw, Gloucester, Massachusetts. A lot of the images are, excuse me, a lot of the locations that Winslow Homer depicts in his work have to do with 
New England. Um, so he is basically active between New York and Maine for most of his career. And he has, uh, he spends a lot of time in New England. A lot of the locations that he depicts are readily identifiable um, and uh, just sort of fun. Um, he is often, people often talk about how much they enjoy the fact or the way that he is able to um, capture the sort of um, sort of innocence of childhood in many cases, which is, you know, a sweet thing to say. And, but really what he sort of depict or what he's sort of picking up on is the fact that there are classes of Americans that are able to live a youth that is rather innocent. And, um, but it's during this time frame that you really start to see that happen. Um, one of the things that I want to sort of point out here, and I think this is sort of interesting as well. Um, so we have to think about beaches and we have to think about the sea, um, the seashore during this time frame. Um, and without me maybe getting my head in the reflection of the of the piece, but um, before the 19th century, the majority of individuals used beaches for either transporting goods, so, you know, as port spaces, or they were using the broad open beaches to create flats that they would be able to evaporate salt water in the production of salt. And, um, and so these uh, beaches largely in America in the 18th, first half of the 19th century were really sort of commercial spaces. They really weren't necessarily, you know, um, uh, there really wasn't the availability nor the desire on behalf of hardworking Americans um, to go to the beach and spend precious time in the day to enjoy the ocean and such. Um, people were much more fearful of water. They were much more fearful of the outdoor beach areas. But um, I think it's really interesting here that while Homer is depicting all of these kids on the seesaw, and you can sort of see the seesaw here in the creating this great diagonal, this really awesome sort of composition through the piece. And you can see the sort of um, the shacks in the back where people would be able to change their clothes um, to get into see where, but he still gives lots of attention to the net here in the foreground in the upper left-hand corner. And he's still sort of like reminding individuals that where this, where this play, where this, um, where this organized leisure activity is happening for kids that are not laboring class um, is happening in a place where laboring class is still uh, still taking place. Um, so there is sort of a social social awareness, even though this is very um, what's the word? I, I used the word earlier. It's um, more than idealistic. It's sort of aspirational. We're going to move down a little bit. to an image called shipbuilding. And um, notice, uh, you probably notice right away that there's two different activities of shipbuilding happening. So there is the commercial ship in the background, but then also the boys in the front creating small boats. And, um, and so there's this sort of dual action. And again, just like we saw before, the sort of contrast between sort of commercial enterprise laboring individuals and individuals enjoying sort of leisure activities. Um, again, it's sort of, a, it's, it's a beach scene and, the, the, and really the artist is sort of foregrounding the whole idea of play and playfulness. Uh, just as a reminder, if anybody has any questions about what they're seeing, feel free to um, feel free to ask. Um, sometimes, as, especially as you get closer, you'll realize that there is um, sometimes present um, a little bit of print or type on the edge of the white pieces um, that you can see from what has been printed on the back side of this. Most of these were printed in magazines and newspapers of the time. This is not a particularly quality paper that these things were printed on. And in many cases, they were never even meant to be really kept. Um, individuals did save these. They often, um, they often um, even framed them for the house. Um, which, you know, made the paper even more precarious because, of course, eventually it's going to end up in, um, in sand and that sort of thing. But, um, but it has to, but you, um, it just has to be sort of reminded, you have to be reminded that um, there's a really good example of this up, up top here. 
So you can see the pale paper, but behind it is the newsprint of, the, of whatever story was happening in that magazine at the time. And Ryan, I know we've described sort of how, what this work is, that it's wood prints um, and other engraving. Can you explain that process? If I'm remembering correctly, this is wood engraving on newsprint. So this is, um, people are taking very, very, very hard pieces of wood. It's usually, if I remember correctly, end grain oak. So you take, um, so oak is cut into timbers um, along the length of the, the, the wood that is felled, the, the tree that is felled. Um, in the, the woods or whatever. So the tree comes down, they cut it long ways into planks. Um, but sometimes they will cut it, uh, particularly thick boards, um, into across the grain so that the grain end is out. And that grain end then is even harder and more compacted. And the artist then supplies images to an individual who will take this end grain carve into it the exact image that Winslow Hover has um, given to them and create these detailed line representations of his original drawing on the wood that can then be inked and then pressed into the paper. They use these really hard forms of wood because they hold up over thousands of printings. So um, uh, it, uh, you're able to use that same sort of piece of wood carved with the little, um, each line that you carve is another uh, will come up black as um, another line in the piece itself. And wood, um, wood engraving of this sort into these very, very hard surfaces um, is able to create a lot of detail, much more detail than you would uh, otherwise think that wood would be able to um, hold over multiple printings. So, um, but, um, but it's also wood, so it's, you know, it's really cheap. It's a much cheaper process than, um, well, I should say it's a rather cheaper process than like um, lithography because you have to have the special limestone stones and sometimes you have to import those and it's cheaper than other kinds of um, um, metal plate engraving, which works really well as well. And newspaper printers were definitely doing that, but then you have to come up with like the copper and zinc metal, um, which isn't always possible, especially during like war periods and stuff like that. So wood engraving, there you go. Uh, we have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, when we had uh, Salvador Dali here, and we had the prints by Salvador Dali, we talked about how he personally was involved in the printmaking process for mm -hmm. this. For clarification on the artworks on display here, um, Winslow Homer created the original drawing and or painting and then gave them to a specific engraver who then engraved them or just kind of shipped them out to printers? Typically the images are sort of commissioned by the newspaper who then, um, so the illustrator, the individuals that's creating um, the, the design for the illustration like Winslow Homer is usually a contractor. Sometimes they're hired directly, but oftentimes they're a contractor, but the printmaker, the individual that translated onto some sort of, um, onto some sort of wood block or into a metal, uh, into a metal substrate, um, not substrate, excuse me, but on a printing matrix, um, those individuals are often employed by the newspapers. And so um, uh, it depends, I think, on the artist and the contract, but many artists will have sort of final say to make sure that the, rep that the image is represented well. But, um, but after a while, a lot of illustrators have a certain kind of following or a certain kind of popularity, a certain sort of celebrity status. So you want to, like printers and newspapers and magazine owners would want to represent their work really, really well. So, um, because it just makes their work more famous as well. So, um, so yeah, I think that it's probably uh, largely faithful to Winslow Homer's work, but as far as I know, Winslow Homer was not the printmaker. Well, he was the print design -er and not the carver. Thanks. Does that help? Yeah, I think that clears it up. Uh, I, I actually got more confused as we started talking <laughs> about that. Um, this is actually one of my favorite images in the show. I think it's hysterical. Um, I could just totally imagine these two like walking along, looking at their phones. Um, it's this kind of idyllic, uh, idyllic sort of youth, um, they're teenage, uh, teenage 
females. They're called the bathers, but bathing is just another term for people hanging out at the beach. And um, they're wearing their fashionable bathing suits. Very risque. Can you imagine? Look how they're, um, I don't know if the images, yeah, you can sort of see it captured. Their ankles are exposed. It's completely crazy. But they kind of look like bratty high school students, don't they? Yeah. And I mean, for those of you looking at this screen here, you can even see like how risque um, totally the Instagram models that these girls are. Uh, even by comparing it to the woman in the background, uh, you can see that she has not only long sleeves and the long skirt, it's belted. She has a large wide brim hat. Um, and the bottom of the skirt is so long and so heavy that it's not even billowing in the waves. Um, for those of you who don't know it, at this time period, these bathing suits um, are made of wool. So yes, <laughs> they're usually a wax treated wool. Um, so they're not, they're not warm, they don't dry fast, uh, they're very heavy and yeah, just, as covered as you can be to go to a beach. And again, you know, one of the things that's great about Wesley Homer is that he's sort of telling the story between, um, with comparison. So you see older women, slightly older women, much more heavily dressed, completely covered in umbrellas with hats, completely, um, uh, completely covered, even in this, you know, what is probably a rather warm circumstance um, behind them here. Um, so perhaps sort of representing an older generation as they take to the beach. And then you have these young kids that are kind of like short sleeves with these little caps and their hair is all whacked and like um, the, their clothes are much more form fitting than everybody else's. And like I said, there are forms of exposed skin. One piece of exposed skin is really on display with this whole arm sort of showing. Um, and notice that the two people here, um, these two young women are unchaperoned which was like a little bit of a shift that's happening really just in the years right after the Civil War. Yeah, and another thing that's um, kind of notable in the scene is that all of the figures that you can make out uh, exactly who they are are all female figures. So this is a whole group of women who are unchaperoned at the time period. So this is a major as Ryan started talking about, this is sort of a major shift in societal norms as a direct result of the war and the roles that women took on during the Civil War in the absence of men. And, you know, I think that one of the things that we should be reminded of is that Winslow Homer, is, um, he knows that he's depicting these things. He knows that he's looking, um, he's, he's kind of becomes a critique, not, I don't know if critique, but at least an observer of contemporary culture. Um, and he knows that he is sharing something that maybe not everybody knows about. Maybe not everybody is aware of these things. Maybe he's, um, uh, but he seems to be sort of sharing something sort of uh, new and interesting and avant-garde, well, not avant-garde, but uh, new and interesting and topical. Um, another great image here called On the Bluff at Long Branch at the Bathing Hour. And um, not only is this just a terrific sort of representation of um, <laughs> women's sporting clothing, if you can imagine such a thing. Um, so these women are literally dressed for the beach um, in, in the um, amazing outfits that they're wearing already. But I want you to just sort of see the popularity of beach culture at this time. So this is uh, done in August of 1870. And just look at all of the throngs of individuals that are lower on the beach. Um, and, you know, we look at these, look at these images of the way that women are dressed in this picture in kind of a critical way. We're kind of like, well, how can they, you know, even enjoy the beach? They're completely covered and the outfits seem completely completely unreasonable and like really difficult and wieldy. But at the same time, you have to remember like these skirts are eight inches shorter than they were just a couple, just before the civil war. They are a narrow silhouette as opposed to an enormous silhouette or a wider silhouette um, with um, no, um, with none of the um, sort of architectural shaping for the dress underneath them. Um, these are 
practically track suit, track suits in comparison to antebellum dresses of the same class. Um, and uh, the hats are much smaller, they're much more manageable. The hair is up and tucked away. So, you know, these women are dressed at least in, to some consideration for the level of activity that they expect to have at the beach. And one more thing I want to point out in this picture as we're talking about it, um, sort of more societal shifting. So one of the things that Winslow Homer uh, does in a lot of these beach pictures, and Ryan has already noted it once, is the bathing house. So if you look carefully at where this line is going, it is one going down the steps to the beach. Um, although it's windy, it does have a white flag up at the top saying that although it's windy, um, the water's fine, uh, go swimming. <laughs> and so what's happening is these ladies are dressed if they are intending to sit at the beach. So for example, like the ladies in the background in this painting, I'm gonna keep saying painting, this print that we just looked at, the ladies right here who are kind of sitting at the beach um, or just casually walking in the sand. Now, if they wanted to don these very promiscuous bathing suits, they would then go down the steps of this image and into the building right here at the bottom that actually is labeled bathing dresses where there'd be individual sort of stalls to change into these bathing suits. Now these were also divided um, by, there was one for men, one for women. Um, there were even cases that if you were really, really, really high class, there would be bathing carts that could be wheeled directly up to the water, um, which we'll actually see in the next one. <laughs> now that I look over there. <laughs> yeah, come on over. This is actually such a great image. So this is like all about the democratization of the swimming space. Look at just the range of individuals that are here in the water and just the amount of fun that they're all having. Men with women, everybody in these like tight fitting, wet clothes, um, individuals actually like of the same, of, um, of opposing sexes sort of actually touching each other in public spaces and the bathing cart that you see. So this is an actual changing cart as, um, as Chris was just talking about that then by servants gets put into the water so that this individual who is high class never even has to be seen in her bathing suit on the beach. She comes into the water directly from the cart. She goes back into the cart afterwards and emerges refreshed and dressed in her old clothing which is the way to go, honestly. Yeah. I mean, come I mean on. they did it. <laughs> um, yeah, and so just looking at this um, picture, the things that you can find the longer you look at it, you have very young children who may or may not be drowning. You have women, you have men, you have different ages, and they're together. And even in the case of this couple right here, um, rather intimately uh, for the time period in public, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then like, like um, I was saying before, the people who do not want to go in the water and are just sort of enjoying the health benefits of sunshine and sea air um, and just being outside the city are still dressed in their sort of everyday clothes. Um, I love images like this because it really does. I mean, I love that the fact that, you know, it's talking about popularization. It also, because um, it also, it seems to me that it sort of talks about a range of classes that are taking to the water, enjoying the water, or able to enjoy the water together. Um, I mean, again, individuals of a leisure class are going to have a lot more time to be able to do these things. But um, you know, underwater, everybody's kind of the same. So there's sort of something that's really terrific about that um, at this time frame when everybody is working really, really hard with their dress and with all of the things that they purchase to be able to talk about class distinction and 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 to differentiate themselves from upper and lower classes around them. So it's um, it's terrific to sort of see the kind of um, devil may care and um, and at the same time, you know, I love this because it reminds me of. Um, uh, 
images that were created during the depression, like the 1920s through the depression and the 1940s. Now, and remember that's only like 60 years away and um, people that are really sort of comically talking about the licentiousness of the, of the, um, of the, the, the beaches where women would, or men and women would parade around in very tiny little bathing suits. There were all sorts of like sexual innuendos happening all the time. And you can really see where that kind of, um, where that attitude about the beach is really sort of emerging from. No wonder it became such a popular destination for Americans. Yeah, the beach, um, the beach really takes off in the mid 1800s, uh, mid to late 1800s, around like 1870. Uh, it was even getting to the point that doctors would be writing prescriptions for people to go to the mm. beach uh, to get better, to get better if you weren't feeling well. Um, unfortunately for women, it was often a cure for hysteria as well, was to go be secluded on a beach for an unknown number of months. Um, God, that sounds awesome. Right? I want to be hysterical. <laughs> um, so there, yeah, there's just a lot happening. So um, I thought we would also do just a quick tour through some of, uh, just a couple of uh, Winslow Homer's um, images about courtship. Um, some of these are just really lovely. They're talking a lot about sort of like youth culture at this time. Um, and I think, why don't we focus on some of these dancing scenes? Mm -hmm. um, he has these wonderful images of um, parties, basically, like people, much like the sort of swimming picture that we just saw at the beach. Um, a lot of these are images that are created to sort of celebrate the party. So this is called the Husking Party, Finding the Red Ears. Um, this is a um, sort of impromptu party at harvest time where individuals are husking corn and then a party sort of breaks out, lots of men and women. You can see the sort of central figures are this male and female figure kissing. Um, I don't know exactly what a red ear is. It's the uh, like a red ear of corn. Oh. As opposed to the yellow. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So. Maybe somebody in the back found one. I don't really know, but <laughs> but it seems like everybody's having a really good time. And here we have um, what's called a cadet hop at West Point from 1859. So this is actually a pre-Civil War image, um, but... Um, I just see an like when I look at this, I just see the sort of expansion of opportunities and in sort of interesting sort of um, activities that Americans are partaking in in this time. And it makes me wonder, like, how many people would really, especially young people this young, would have been partaking in um, balls really of this sort? Um, and here, this isn't necessarily sort of a town ball or um, something, you know, a private party that's being put on. Um, this is sort of a specialized thing just for cadets at West Point. So um, this is just one type of party that people are sort of partaking in at this time. And um, so this kind of specialization, this kind of um, uh, rules that are applied to a wide range of um, individuals within society. And uh, like I said, just all of these levels of activities that are sort of opened up for individuals. And with that, um, it's a little bit off the course that Ryan and I had previously charted, uh, <laughs> but there is, since we're talking kind of about the bending of societal rules um, and what you get away with and the different roles that people have, I want to actually take us into the other gallery with just, um, a ludicrous dance scene for the time. Oh, here, I, I just, you? I just, yeah, sure. I just went on an adventure to find it. Ooh. Um, so what we're, what we're gonna look at, um, just keep in mind the time period that those bathing suits were, you know, kind of risque. They're new and the crazy things that are happening. We're gonna go right next to the giant Winslow Homer on the right hand side. Again, just sort of take in the sheer magnitude of the show. There's just a lot of images, but it's a lot of fun. So we're going to go up here to the Parisian ball. Oh. <laughs> uh, so we'll try and oop, sorry, give us one. Give us one second. second. A little technical difficulty here. I know it did this. 
Guys, we all learn stuff doing these. We're giving you an elevated view. So we're gonna go right up here to the very top one. Uh, so this is called the Parisian Ball. Um, dancing in Paris. Uh, so this is still being created at the same time. And it's just showing sort of the styles that were happening in dance around the world and how they were influencing um, American printmaking and American images. Um, so here we have both men and women sort of high step in it. Um, and it's one of the reasons I love this particular work is one, the ladies are still in sort of those flowing dresses. They've gotten out of the antebellum period style of dress and they're not being, they're not in the big hoop, skirt, hoop skirts. Um, they are showing their ankles. Uh, these are upstanding ladies. I wanna be clear about that. Um, but they are kicking up their feet, including this one guy in the back who's just really serious. I think he about might have it. actually lost his leg. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's just a really fun image. Um, because you have to remember that at this time period, the wealthy in the US and the upper middle class, if they were able to, would go to Europe. Um, and try to become cultured that way and they would go on tour and Paris would be one of the places they would hit and coming into sort of the time period that this is this is in this particular one being in 1867 Paris and Japan are two of the most highly influential places to U.S. um sort of style and depiction mm. um, just for the different things that are happening. It tended to be Japan for sort of the artistic style and then Paris for the societal and um, I guess personal style. How well, it was just it. so sophisticated. I mean, um, Paris was sort of, the, everybody sort of considered Paris as sort of the style center of the world at this point. Um, and um, I mean, a lot of that had to do with the, sort of the, popularization of museums, a lot of that had to do with the art academies that have been um, uh, churning out world famous artists for 150 years at that point. Um, but, um, you know, uh, well, maybe not, you know, but um, so wealthy American women would um, either travel to or buy dresses, have them sent from famous designers in Paris at this time. Um, a lot of the most expensive and fantastic um, silks and other kinds of um, trims for costumes were being produced and exported from France at this time. Um, uh, this was the sort of, uh, you start to see the sort of, um, uh, large scale popularization of French cuisine at this time. Like um, everybody was, and, and, you know, and wealthy individuals were raised speaking French. Um, so there was just this, um, there was just this adoration of all things French. And at the same time, as uh, Kristen had talked about, not necessarily represented in this, in this image, however, um, uh, France was, uh, much more accessible than Japan, even though Japanese art and culture, well, mostly Japanese art and design really, was uh, being sort of um, imported into all parts of Western culture at this time and just making a huge, huge, huge influence upon um, fashion, interiors, decorative arts, architecture. Um, it really just had um, this, there, it, it's called the wave of Japanism that happens during um, the second half of the 19th century with the reopening of Japan to trade with Western cultures. So that was my detour. I, just, I had <laughs> yeah, to share yeah, this yeah. picture. Now we can see the world from Ryan's point of view. All right. <laughs> um, I think just to give you a little bit more of a rounded sensibility as well, I did want to also point out some of the images that um, Winslow Homer made very early in his career. Um, and this was sort of like, um, sort of where he originated from, but it, not, it wasn't necessarily where he settled on. However, he kept returning back to these things over and over again. So these would be some of the last images that I shared today. Um, again, feel free to ask questions anytime. One of the things that I wanted to point out was that he created um, 
a lot of uh, portraits of uh, politicians, writers, um, people that were sort of culturally influential, uh, individuals that were sort of social critics of the time. Um, he, um, and he had a lot of his um, portraits published in uh, newspapers and magazines with national syndication. So um, a lot of his images, he, he helped popularize a lot of individuals within culture. Um, so this is the Honorable El Elihu B. Washburn of Illinois, chairman of, of the Committee on Commerce um, from 1860. But there are other people here like Captain Robert Forbes and um, a daguerreotypist named Samuel Masseret and Madame Laborde, the prima donna, um, a famous musician at this time. So, I mean, there were kind of all over the place between art and politics and culture. Um, But this is um, it's probably kind of unfair to sort of um, have these be the last images that you'll see tonight. But um, this is actually sort of the origins of Winslow Homer. These are images that were created in the 18, like mid 1850s. And these are covers for sheet music um, catalogs. So these are, um, uh, they're sort of images that are created, sort of idealized images that are created. Maybe they sort of reference the, um, the, the sheet music that's inside. Um, but for the most part, there's just kind of, almost kind of generic images. You can see that he is, um, that he really emerges after some practice as a really terrific draft person. Um, but it takes a little while for him to kind of get there too. Some of the stuff that you're seeing is a little bit more primitive, a little bit more unpracticed um, than things that he um, eventually comes into. And also these are, well, the sheet music of course is gonna be very popular, but it's not necessarily a place where individuals are noted for their artistic skills. So this was really his origins and he emerged further and further um, into the world of sort of high illustration and then eventually broke into that world of um, fine art and fine art collect, um, fine art um, and selling fine art and sort of making a career off of that pretty much exclusively towards the end of his life. So, um, or really the second half of his career. So um, yeah, humble origins, but pretty, pretty dramatic heights professionally. So, um, do join us, uh, Kristen and I, next month for the second half of this tour. We'll be talking a lot about the Civil War. We'll be talking a lot more about politics. We'll, we'll be looking at the images that sort of influence a lot of popular culture at this time. Um, and we'll go into um, a little bit more of the Winslow Homer biography. Any other questions? All right, well, we're gonna check out. See you soon, bye.